fantastic. So I have indeed spent the last two years researching Glywood and it has proved to be the most exciting and interesting project. I've enjoyed every minute. And I have personally attended the Winter Conference of Glywood every year since 1998. And I've always been struck by Glywood's combination of very dissimilar experiences. It is a fascinating and sometimes quite contradictory mix of creativity and confusion, uh, miracles and mishaps, learning and loneliness. And in some ways, it is a microcosm of the majority of the Anglo-Jewish world, I would say with the exception of the ultra-Orthodox Haredi world. And uh, it's also a global phenomenon, so there's yet another contradiction. It depends on and it celebrates volunteers, but it also le led to many cases of volunteer burnout. And the more you look at it, the more aspects seem to invite investigation. And I waited for years to, for, for somebody else to write the book about Limud, and eventually I came to the realization that that was going to have to be me. So what have I been doing? Uh, for the last two years, I have been interviewing people involved in Limud, uh, from the founders to many of the past chairs of the organization and chairs of the annual conferences, uh, from dedicated volunteers with years and years of limited experience to day visitors from other faith communities who've just popped in. I've in interviewed young adults who grew up as Limud kids, and I've also talked to people who went once and didn't like it at all and never came again. So uh, just to start, well, uh, I'll show you a, a nice picture. Um, I have permission from all the people in this picture to share it because two of those are my daughters, and I just feel this this very much uh, encapsulates the spirit of Limud, a certain scruffy wild abandon, uh, enjoyment, unlikely people, all in, all in it together, having a good time. And you could say that is very much essence of Limud. So um, I've also collected an almost complete set of the conference programs uh, from 1980 to the online programs that were held during the pandemic. Uh, I am missing some. If by any chance you have 1984, 1988 and 1989 at home, please get in touch. Those are the holy grail. Uh, I've also been given all sorts of Limud Fest programs, personal archives from people who organized it in the early days, uh, and even a dinner invitation for Limud uh, Bar Mitzvah celebration in 1993. Limud is hoping to set up an archive with this material, complemented by recording some transcripts of most of the 141 interviews I've been lucky enough to conduct. And many interviewees are here today, which is rather fun. I will be using material from those interviews throughout uh, the, the uh, lecture. Most of them will be anonymized, but you'll have a chance to sample the actual authentic voices of Limo. So that brings us to the question of, what have I found out? Well, quite a lot, and this is a short lecture, but I'm, and I'm still processing much of the material, but I'm going to give you a tour of some of the most exciting themes that have emerged from this. Uh, I'd like to look at four major themes, and I'm going to trace them quite loosely through the four decades of Limwood's existence. And I'll end with some reflections on the challenges that Limwood faces now as it moves into its fifth decade. So what are our four themes? Give me one more. There we are. So the first is building the Limud community. How did that original small educators conference become a unique type of community? What purpose does it serve in the wider Jewish community and beyond? Uh, whom does it include? Whom does it exclude? And we'll consider this theme in most depth because this really is perhaps the basic issue and of course the central to the foundation and growth of the Limud. Our second theme, we'll look at Limud's volunteer culture. What is so special about it? Uh, what are its advantages? What are its disadvantages? What effects does it have on those who participate in it? And this, as we'll see, began to develop particularly in the second decade, in the 1990s of Limud's existence. Then we'll move on to international Limud, which started to blossom in the early 2000s. Uh, how did Limud spread abroad? How are resources allocated? Is it an empire? Or is it more of a confederation, perhaps, or a commonwealth? Uh, the first non-UK uh, Limud was in Australia in 1999, and that set off this very rapid decade that we will examine a little bit more. And our last theme is cr the creativity, adaptability, and influence of Limud. Is Limud still creative? 
uh, what has been its influence on the Jewish community and beyond, and how is Limud adapting to a changing Jewish world and particularly to the pandemic. So that's roughly what we're going to be looking at. And we'll start with community. So how did the whole thing begin? In quite a small and modest way. In 1979, Michael May, a Jewish communal official, was offered a free trip to CAGE, the Conference for Alternatives in Jewish Education. CAGE was a large American Jewish educators conference founded in 1976, it went on till 2009, and it's been described as the Jewish Woodstock. So May was allowed, asked to take along two British Jewish educators and he recruited Alastair Falk, an English teacher, and Rabbi Mickey Rosen, who had just the year before, in 1978, founded Yakar, an unusual and uh, exciting learning center. All three were very impressed by CAGE. They liked the creativity they saw there. They liked the cross-denominal cross nature of the conference, and they felt that they should start something up in the UK uh, on a small scale. Unfortunately, Rabbi Rosen was just too busy with the car, so he dropped out. But Falk and May recruited Clive Lawton, who's been involved ever since. Uh, he was then education director of the Board of Deputies of British Jews. And they also found Jonathan Benjamin, an English teacher, and the first conference was quite modest. It took place in December 1980 at Carmel College, a small Jewish boarding school. The first attendees, there were about 80 of them, were mostly educators, but in the widest sense possible. That included Heide teachers, included teachers in non-Jewish school, included youth workers, and there were 53 sessions, 34 presenters, about a third were women, and participants came from both Orthodox and non Orthodox denominations, and the whole thing was a roaring success. The two features that all the early attendees whom I interviewed remember are first, the novelty of having a choice of sessions. They had an unbelievable three to four sessions in each of the day slots. And those of you who know today's Lord, where you can have 25 sessions per slot will be unimpressed, but it was a complete novelty back then. The other thing they all remember is the sheer excitement of meeting and learning from people from other denominations, because at the time that was not happening very much in the UK, if at all. Most of the sessions do seem rather earnest by today's standards. I'll give you a little bit of a sample here. They were all very pedagogical in nature. So things like this, uh, whose needs, theirs or yours, and look at how different age levels absorb information differently, teaching about Israel, Jewish roots, how to run a local history project in your community, family education, an American approach might not go down so well these days. It was very homemade, it was very improvised, and the finances were extremely rocky. The event actually made a deficit of about £8,000, and the way in which this was dealt with I think gives a real flavour of the rather haphazard level of organisation at this very early stage. Uh, Clive Lawton had a little reminisce about this, and he told me at the end of the conference they had a meeting, and we asked them, do you want this to happen again? And they all went, absolutely, and so-and-so should come. They were all very enthusiastic about it. They all pretty well signed up to be involved in organizing the next year and so forth. And we passed round a bucket and people put into this bucket money and checks. So we were now in a situation of going back to donors and saying, look, people really believe in this. They want it to happen. Can you close the shortfall? And we did. Uh, a little, uh, unlike perhaps the way Limud is now run. As the conference was held over Christmas, people brought their families along, there was childcare, there was a rudimentary children's program, and spouses who weren't educators, of course, needed something to go to. So right from the beginning, there were sessions that were not about education in the narrow sense. It was a residential conference, so quite naturally an entertainment program developed in the evenings with a film or a table quiz or singing around the piano. And much the same recipe was followed in the next few years and numbers began to rise, reaching over 200 participants by 1990 with 25% more presenters. Limud was held at Carmel College again in 1981 and 82. In 83, the school canceled at very short notice and the conference just didn't happen that year. So they decided they would look elsewhere in the future and that started a decade of rather a nomadic existence, starting in 84 with two years at Portsmouth, which meant that they had to organize kosher catering for the very first time. Of course, Carmel College had provided it. The first year, there was an ecological disaster. 
uh, everyone remembered this, with homolis meals complete with mounds of packaging being bussed down from London. So next year, some of the organizers decided they would do the cooking themselves which they continued to do until numbers began to rise and rise and rise, particularly around about 1995, there was an enormous rise in numbers. All the participants had to do kitchen duty, had to clean up, were involved in the childcare, and this pattern continued really until the next venue at Oxford Polytechnic, uh, which was used from 1986 to 1994, because at this stage numbers were really getting larger. As the mood grew, however, the focus soon moved away from children's education and pedagogic concerns to a, a much wider range of things. And we can see this if we look at the next slide. Let's see. Oops. Share screen. Oh, hang on. Let's try that again. Yes. There we are. Okay. So if you look at this, I have done some counting, um, judging this is all from programs uh, and, con and conference handbooks, and the red bars are the educational sessions or anything remotely pedagogic, and the grey ones are everything else, including text study. And you can see that, in fact, the only year in which there was a majority of education sessions was the first year. After that, they get less and less and less, and you can see by the time you get to 1997, educational sessions are really quite small. Uh, the big, big jump is really, I would say, 1992 and 1994. And after that, it never looked back from not necessarily being an educational conference. I'm sorry, there are gaps. That's why I haven't got the programs. So it began to change. Uh, from 1994 onwards, uh, pedagogical or educational in the strict sense sessions have always been a quite a small percentage. And to get an idea of what else was going, uh, you get in 1994 a listing of different groupings or tracks, and they included arts and crafts, a bit midrash, a study session, community, ethics, entertainment, drama and stories, literature and poetry, music, dance and song, religion and prayer, science and ethics, and Torah study. And you can see it's really hugely expanded beyond the, the original limits of education. So looked at in the wider context, this actually isn't such a surprise as change from an educational conference to a more family or community-based event, because compared to the, the USA, the number of Jewish educators working in Jewish contexts in the UK was very small indeed. Most new attendees in the 1990s weren't educators, they were just people who came along and they didn't actually have any educational role at all. A major role in this whole transformation of Limud into something for the entire Jewish community was played by Andrew Gilbert, who was chair of Limud organization from 1990 to 97, and of the conference itself from 90 to 94. He was not an educator himself, but he recognized Limud's potential as a training ground for future community leaders and activists. And he sought out volunteers who had been active in the Jewish youth movements and also in this way, considerably lowered the average age of the people running the event. He also encouraged the development of this much wider, wider range of programming. And Limwood became much more ambitious under his reign. A family education program was introduced. Scholarships for Jewish students were set up. An exchange program with the CAGE conference in America was set up. Fundraising was far better organized and the constitution, structure, and mission statement of Limud were thoroughly overhauled. Now, it is possible that if Limud had just remained a conference for educators, it might have peaked in the early 1990s, which we know it didn't. And growth uh, continued at a very rapid rate. As you can see from a quick look between 1980 and 2000, numbers of participants. And you can see it just suddenly, about the mid-1990s, it just doubles every year, it's, it's real, or at least goes up by a third every year to current numbers are very often 2,500 or thereabouts. But you can see this remarkably rapid growth as it takes off in the middle of the 90s. So looking back, you know, why did this happen? My interviews, uh, interviewees often cited the growth in numbers as a factor in the change as more educators, or uh, sorry, more non-educators were turning up. Uh, that also changes in leadership were important and changes in the, the range of people attending. And here are samples from two interviewees on this development. 
So the first one told me, I think size made it change and possibly people leading the conference had different ideas. They were no longer educators who were leading the conference. So they had different ideas and they wanted to move it over to something else. Whereas when it started, everybody who was a key player was involved in education, whether it be informal or formal, adult or children. And another interview, he said, by 1995, I think it was beginning to transition from what clearly had started as an educator's network and was very focused on the practicalities of Jewish education to more of a participant focused event. There were people there from very small communities who were similar to me. I was single, it was something to do over Christmas. I'm interested in studying things. So it was moving towards the mass participation then. So as this interview we noted, more and more people from very small isolated Jewish communities or with no affiliation to any Jewish community were beginning to turn up at Limwood to recharge their Jewish batteries and to connect with and explore their Jewish identity. And this speeded up the move away from a purely pedagogic focus. In addition to the larger numbers, the changes in the nature of both the leaders and the participants, the wider Jewish community was also changing with a new sense that adult education on Jewish topics was urgently needed. And this was very clear to Limud participants. And one of them told me, at an AGM in the 1990s, Alastair Falk said, this should be an educator's retreat. No more, no less. And Andrew Gilbert said, this should be a festival of learning. We said, the assembled multitude said, things have moved on. We actually don't need an educator's retreat anymore because in those 10 odd years or more, the Jewish community has changed radically. The institutions have changed radically. We don't need an educator's retreat as such, but we do need a festival of Jewish learning. In the wake of this transformation, Limud became a unique community within the wider UK Jewish community. My interviewees often focused on this and they explained how important it was to them to find a place where they could explore Judaism and their Jewish identity in a safe, diverse and welcoming context. Some of them explicitly contrasted this with the more judgmental and monolithic atmosphere of their home communities. And many of them used remarkably emotive language describing Limud as a different time zone, holy space, a bubble, magical world, Narnia, or even a taste of the world to come. And one said, Limud is like the community incubator. It's the community retreat. It's the community cross-communal. It's the community where reality is suspended and we can do all sorts of things that we might not be able to do in our home communities in front of the rabbi. The taste of the world to come stuff, absolutely. In the world to come, we would of course be doing lots of this together without the boundaries and the angst and all the stuff that gets in the way. And for many people nowadays, Limud is a core part of their Jewish identity. Over time, Limud has developed conventions, routines, and even language that reinforces its communal aspects and strengthens a sense of belonging. There are in-jokes about the food, especially the jacket potatoes that are a staple of Limud lunches. The bar and the dinner queue have developed into recognizable Limud institutions, and there's a special set of Limud terms that reflect the egalitarian ethos. Participants rather than audience or attendees. Sessions rather than lectures, and presenters rather than lecturers. But the flip side of this tight community atmosphere is the loneliness felt by many people who attend on their own. Those who were shy, older, or didn't already have friends at the conference sometimes stopped going because of the isolation they experienced at Limud, particularly as the main winter event expanded from the late 1990s onwards, reaching 2,000 participants around about the year 2000. Some interviews, uh, interviewees who had stopped going used the word overwhelming to describe the sensation of being lost in a crowd of busy participants rushing from one session to the next. We always had a problem with loneliness and how to get people on their own to meet other people. The last time I went, which was probably about a year or so before COVID, I did find it a lonely experience. I think the people who go on their own very often don't go again because it's very isolating and I don't know a way around it. We tried all sorts of things and we never came up with any successful solution. And for those who try to become part of the organizing team, it can be very hard to gain entrance to the core of the organization. One well-known Limud activist told me it took her five years to get into the inner circle of the organizing team, in spite of her repeated offers to volunteer on it. 
But despite the somewhat cliquey nature of Limoud in its core team, many participants did experience it as a new type of community that offered them a liberating and creative alternative to what was available back home, without the denominational boundaries and tensions that they were used to. Some people with no affiliation at all to formal Jewish communities do come back year after year. Interviewees speak of, spoke of Limud friends around the UK and indeed around the world. Some people constructed most of their social networks via Limud and there were dozens at least of matches made there. The pandemic made it clear that this is the feature of Limud that people miss most profoundly. Not the sessions, not the escape from Christmas, another function of Limud, but the sense of a genuine and vibrant community, which was not the same on Limud, as everyone pointed out to me. And I think perhaps the sensation of Limud as community was best expressed by one participant's small daughter, who asked about visiting Limud, and he realized she thought Limud went on all year round with some exclusive community, which they had access to just once a year. She didn't realize it was a once a year event. And I think that conveys something of this feeling of, it is a community which the overwhelming majority of people I spoke to emphasize very much. So our second theme is the development of Limud's volunteer culture, and here we'll focus principally on the second decade of Limud, the 1990s. Active volunteering was built in from the beginning, quite naturally, given the sketchy finances. Participants created the event themselves rather than turning up for something provided by others or by professionals. In the first decade of Lemur, as we noted, participants had to sign up for kitchen duty and other practical tasks. But gradually, as the numbers of participants rose, this became less and less realistic. And in Lemur's second decade, two trends developed, pulling in different directions. A process of professionalization set in, while simultaneously, volunteering became a prominent and celebrated element of Lemur that was very consciously and energetically promoted. Now, professionalization was inevitable, uh, given the growing numbers. First, the catering, then other essential elements such as security, childcare, first aid had to be farmed out. As time went on, Limwood began to hire permanent employees, both as executive directors and as office managers. Clive Lawton was hired as part-time director in 1997, and Helen Lyons became Limwood's first full-time administrator in 2001. And this ignited a debate that continues today about the border between volunteers and paid staff. Where exactly should that be drawn? Why should catering be put out to tender, but not program design? Within Limud today, you can find different voices about the, the, on these matters still. So to give you two samples, my conviction was that Limud's office should always be understaffed, but if you overstaffed it, if you staffed it fully, it would start to pull away the responsibility of volunteers to do stuff. They could start meeting and deciding what should be done by the professionals, which was not the name of the game. And in the other direction, I think it's too big to be volunteer run still. I think it's outgrown that stage because I think it's just so much that's being asked of people. And my feeling of it is the people who are setting what is required of people are the people like me who are obsessive and will happily do an additional full-time job on top of our regular jobs to make this work. Volunteers bring huge amounts of, of creativity, passion, and skills. So to give you an example, a unique database known as the Thing of Beauty was built by Gideon Smith and other tech-savvy volunteers in the mid-1990s. It was lovingly refined afterwards to allow maximum flexibility. It was delicately tuned to Limwood's needs for programming, accommodation, and registration. Later on, Limwood commissioned very expensive commercial database, which failed totally. The new database simply could not replicate the many different ways of presenting and collating information that had been built into the homegrown product, and they had to go back to the homegrown product. In the early 2000s, the original version was moved onto the internet and updated, and it is still being used. It is a monument to volunteer creativity and dedication. And this is a quote from Gideon Smith, who built it. The new database is really designed to run multiple events and multiple types of events. And so we built that for about 10 to 12 years. I would meet every Monday evening with David Shotton, who was my brother in arms or this, or compatriot or the only other person who was willing to build these things. And we would build the database together. That's a pretty enormous input of volunteer goodwill and passion. 
As noted during the 1990s, volunteering ceased to be a natural part of the rather basic conference infrastructure and became more of an ideological ideal, held up as central to the very idea of Limud. As one of the leaders in that decade told me, Limud for me is not the event, it's the community of volunteers that make it happen. For him and many others, the heart of Limud was the conference team, which formed a tight community of its own within the wider Limud community. Several team members told me that friends they made while working on the team were still central to their no social networks, and there were quite a few marriages between team members. Interviewees told me of coming home after a full day's work and then spending four to five hours on the phone on Limud business, as well as much of the weekend, for most of the year leading up to the conference itself. It was like having a second full-time job in many cases. At conference itself, they often only had a couple of hours sleep each day and didn't even get to the sessions but they felt amply rewarded by the knowledge that they had created something unique by being members of the inner core of the organization. At the end of the annual gala, all the team trooped up on the stage and were applauded by the rest of the participants. And that brief recognition and dimension in the conference handbook was enough for many of them. This almost sacrificial flavor became part of the volunteer mystique promoted in liberal publicity and publications and enshrined in its core values, which we'll sample. So core value participation, volunteerism is a key feature of almost everything we do. We are all responsible for each other and for the communities we create. Everyone has an important contribution to make. We encourage participants to take an active part in all we do. Or empowerment, we inspire people to be ambitious about their contribution. We challenge people and trust them to rise to that challenge. We see the potential of individuals and communities and support their development. We empower people to make choices and provide the information to make informed choices. Power lies with the participant. Later still, the move in 2015 from the university campus to a hotel environment at the National Exhibition Center in Birmingham added further emphasis to the growing distinction between the volunteer, the ideal Limudnik, and the mere participant on a somewhat lower level. So I think from 93 to 2000, those seven years that I was involved, enshrined volunteerism as a culture that, beco that becoming a key part of the identity was how Libwood was organized, as well as a determination not to let denomination be relevant. And somebody else told me, I do think that in 1995, everyone at Libwood was a volunteer on some level, and that was very clear. Whereas I think in 2005, that wasn't clear anymore. In 2015, it was even less clear. And it was very much like, do you want to be a volunteer? Or do you want to be a participant? And there's that word they invented, volunticipate, and it is a ridiculous word. But at the same time, for me, actually, it holds a lot of value, like the concept of, it, of there is no such thing as just being a paying participant at the book. And I don't think there should be. I think everyone should, on some level, in some way, have to do some level of volunteering. The point of volunteering is definitely not maximum efficiency. It was and remains far more focused on the transformative effect on the volunteers themselves. That's the reason we got money from funders, because we were saying to them, we could bring young people into community and train them for communal leadership, and give them a passion for communal leadership, because we can give them an experience that will be difficult to get. However, though ensuring that Limud remains a grassroots organization, and also playing a vital role in training Jewish community leaders, putting volunteers in charge of events that welcome over 2,000 attendees raises a host of problems. Many volunteers lack experience in organizing events of this size or in dealing with their financial side. And it's difficult to sack a volunteer who doesn't do the job very well. Volunteers sometimes drop out for various reasons, and that puts more of a load on those who remain. Burnout is very common among Libod volunteers. And some of my interviews spoke about the damage that were done to them, in the sense that they, when they weren't useful anymore, nobody was very interested. I think it's a shame that people's Limud experience, their Limud journey ends that way, when they've put so much into Limud. And it feels like Limuds almost chew them up and spat them out once they're no longer useful. And it's understandable that people leave Limud or they stop coming or they stop volunteering for family reasons or professional reasons, whatever it may be. But when it's because Limud has just drained you mentally and emotionally and physically, that says to me that there's a wider problem in the organization that they haven't properly acknowledged it yet. But even if they have, they certainly haven't fixed it. And sometimes using volunteers in key positions exposed the organization to an unacceptable level of risk. One of the tensions 
as you can imagine, when you become a multinational entity, is the limits of volunteerism. If a volunteer wants to be responsible for marketing and their day job is something very different, well, that was always encouraged. Volunteer about things you're passionate about. But if you were the treasurer or the bookkeeper and your day job was something totally different and you couldn't read a profit and loss spreadsheet, we were in trouble. And that had happened a few times on event teams and other roles in different places. So we realize that certain things have to be regulated in a certain way, otherwise it exposes the organization to financial risk. So again, we see two sides of the story. Volunteers are still the lifeblood of Limud, which cannot survive without them, even though it does increasingly rely on professionals for certain aspects of its administration and events. In return for creating events enjoyed by thousands of people, volunteers have a chance to use their creativity and also to learn a wide range of skills that can often help them in their careers and community roles. But on the other side, lack of attention to volunteers and expectations that they will sacrifice everything in order to deliver, even sometimes in cases when they lack the necessary skills and experience, can exact a very heavy price in terms of burnout and damage to mental health. To their credit, Limud leaders are aware of these dangers and they have developed volunteer care roles and year-round volunteer training, but there's still a lot of work to do on this aspect. We're going to move on to a very brief account of our third theme, the growth of Limud outside the UK, which I think I might have to write a separate book on. Uh, it, it's always been a feature of Limud. International participants and presenters were there from the very beginning. And at that first conference in 1980, there were educators from the Netherlands, Switzerland, Italy, and the USA. In 1987, a fifth, but the main very rapid development of Limud Brooks and Events Abroad coincided with Limud's third decade, the first decade of the 2000s, when the UK conference was perhaps at its peak. This is the heroic or classical period of Limud which saw the move from Nottingham University to Warwick University in 2007, and also much larger and more diverse programs than ever before. And all sorts of things were happening. Day limits were flourishing, the first in 1993 in Leeds, soon after Manchester in 1995, and in the 2000s, more and more places within the UK. There was a family limit held near Sheffield in 1999, and in 2004, that was replaced by Limudfest, a summer camping experience or partially camping experience uh, given to his proclivities or lack of proclivities of camping uh, and that went on till 2011 when its financial state just didn't allow it to be continued anymore. So the time, time was ripe for expansion and experimentation. The first non-UK group to hold a Limud, as we mentioned, was Bud Oz in Australia in 1999. By 2003, there were five groups. The extra four were in Jerusalem, the Galilee, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. And it became very clear that there was a real appetite for more such events around the world. The development uh, caught the leaders of UK Limud quite by surprise. As the numbers began to rise, they started to be a little concerned about some basic issues. What sort of events deserved to be called Limud? Were there criteria or standards? such as providing kosher food or ensuring that all denominations were free to present? Did the Limud organization in the UK have the power to prevent groups calling themselves Limud elsewhere? In 2006, a section of the Limud uh, organization called Limud International was set up with, Albert Gil with Andrew Gilbert as its first chair to try to bring some order to this chaotic process. And this quickly re yielded results. Uh, by 2008, there were 46 Limud groups around the world, and they started a formal training scheme. There were 30 trained volunteers who traveled around and produced training in various countries in uh, Limud's values, in organizational methods, and so on. Uh, they held training seminars in the UK for Limud activists from abroad. And the worldwide expansion of Limud seemed unstoppable, and I think that gives this graph gives you some idea. Uh, it went from one in 1999 to about 45 or more in 2011. And it's actually increased to about, I think there are about 94 groups, not all of them active around the world at the moment. However, everyone in the Limud leadership was pretty busy with putting on the UK annual conference and they didn't have the time, or in some cases the interest, to put a lot of effort into planning or shaping this headlong growth. Things started to get complicated. In the mid 2000s, you started to get this emergence of a number of other copycat organizations. 
a number of organizations inspired around the world with a Limud name, but not actually run by Limud in the UK, but affiliated in some way. So what you then had is a charity with two functions. On the one hand, it was organizing events in the UK, and on the other hand, it was inspiring and supporting Limud groups around the world. And there's another leading figure in Limud International told me, you could say that Limud made a mistake in not establishing a franchise right away for international groups. Or you could say that what it did supply, a model and training, was good. The result has been that later, trying to organize the non-UK groups was like herding cats. The growth of Limud FSU, a group of Limud-type events headed by Chaim Chesler in the countries of the former Soviet Union, has posed a particular challenge. The first event was held in Moscow in 2006, and there were later ones in Belarus, Ukraine, and among Russian-speaking Jews in Israel and in America. They've held over 75 events so far. But is it really Limud? The organizational structure there is much more hierarchical with a professionalized top-down model, most unlike Limud UK. There's a system of star presenters who are treated as VIPs. And outside the, of the actual formal Soviet Union itself, there's a focus on only the Russian-speaking part of local Jewish communities. Certainly, Limud FSU raised question marks at the time back in the UK. In terms of political function, certainly, Klein Chesler went and did his own thing. And we were trying to keep him as much as possible on brand and bring their people over for training with us as well, recognizing that he was going to do his own thing as well. And somebody else described Limud FSU as saying, it's very professionally driven and it's based on bringing the big names. And you have a small group of people who try and get involved and organize things. They've got certain kinds of features of a Limud British style. Yet again, it feels like it's countercultural to the Limud spirit in the sense of saying it's taking a particular portion of the Je Jewish population and isolating them from the rest. It will be like saying, well, in Britain, there's a Spanish and Portuguese Limud and they don't participate in Limud in Britain. But the tension between international Limud and UK Limud has deeper roots than just the fact that some Limuds are more independent and do their own thing. Again, as central figures involved in international Limud told me, it's difficult to talk about Limud today without realizing the conflict that international has brought to Limud in the UK. Is Limud a UK-based community about our community and changing our community and we support other groups internationally because we see the benefit of what Limud is and therefore we help communities? Or is Limud internationally a thing of itself, which was or is headquartered in the UK and therefore puts on an international event, I, not just the local conference, it's an international event. And yes, most people are going to be from the UK at the event because that's geographically convenient. So that question is a tension. In other words, is, UK a, uh, is Limud a UK-centered empire with many colonies abroad? Or is the UK merely part of a worldwide movement which just happened to start in Britain? It's fascinating to contemplate how closely this echoes wider British concerns about the UK's place in Europe and the world. And if we note that Limud International was closed down as a separate branch in 2016, the same year as the Brexit referendum. More recently in 2020, a decision was taken by UK Limud leadership to cease organizing or supervising Limuds outside the UK, who are now forming regional groupings of their own. Uh, this move has been both praised and denigrated. Is it decolonization or is it an abandonment of the responsibilities and membership of a truly international community? So our last theme taking us into the last decade of Limud is that of creativity, influence and adaptability. We've already mentioned plenty of creativity in early Limud, like the Thing of Beauty database, and almost every year in the second and third decades saw new features of the program, such as the Havruta project, one of the jewels in the crown of Limud. This ran for 20 years, from 96 to 2015, and offered a session focused on classical Jewish texts that were studied in traditional Havruta pairs. At its peak, over 400 people would be learning together, with world experts and beginners equally welcome to discuss and argue their way through specially prepared booklets, focusing on a theme every year, such as time, responsibility, or war and peace. Limud also became one of the first places where new topics of interest to the Jewish community in the UK and beyond could be introduced before they trickled down to community institutions. So environmental issues appeared in the program in the 90s, as did LGBTQ topics, first in the form of presentations and discussions, and later adding diverse social spaces across the event. In 2011, 
Nimud La'am, a pioneering program of sessions that were designed to be accessible both to regular participants and to adults with learning disabilities, formed part of the main conference. However, there did develop a sense among several of my interviewees that creativity has declined over this last decade, over the 2010s, that the annual conference, by now rebranded as festival, has got into something of a rut. Nimud has its reputation of being innovative and counterculture and all those things, and yet it has not been innovative for a very, very long time. And it's not necessarily receptive to innovation, which I think is really problematic. Nimud in the UK, specifically festival, is wonderful and it's lovely and it is completely stagnant. And I think that there is a way to be able to look at that and to develop it while meeting the needs of people who love what it is right now and creating something that not only is innovative but encourages innovation. If we move on to the influence of Limud on the wider Jewish community and even beyond, this does seem to be long lasting and pervasive on the other hand. Many leading figures in Jewish communal leadership got their start at Limud and many institutions incorporated different aspects of Limud's values and ways of working. I'd like to look quickly at three examples. One, direct influence on a Jewish institution. The second, a non-Jewish institution modeled on Limud directly. And thirdly, an example of more diffuse influence of Limud. So first we have the case of JW3, the big Jewish community center in London that opened in 2013. Raymond Simonson, who was appointed as Limud's first full-time director in 2006, is now the CEO of JW3, and he explicitly described the strong influence of Limud on the design of JW3. JW3 would not be as JW3 is without Limud. JW3 itself might exist as this Jewish community center. It wouldn't be the thing it is now if it wasn't for Limud. And that's because I got a bit of a free reign, not entire free reign, but quite a bit of free reign to build it in the image that I wanted. So when I came to JW3, I'd been craving a way of expanding the spirit of Limud year round. If you took a blood sample or DNA sample of JW3, you would find such a massive part of it as Limud. Our second example, maybe surprisingly, is the British Islam Conference, which first took place in 2015, founded by Dilwar Hussein, uh, who was founder of an organization called New Horizons in British Islam. He first visited Limud in 2004, came back several times, and set up the British Islam Conference very much based on the model. On the first occasion that I turned up, I just found it amazing. It was so eye-opening that something like this happened, and that religious people were involved in a dialogue or a pedagogical venture of this nature. It was so creative to me in the way that it was structured and set up. I wouldn't say we copied, because I don't think we could, but we borrowed the ethos, or part of the ethos, I would imagine, and then tried to make it something of our own. So that spirit was taken and then manifested in a way that would work with a Muslim audience. In the blog that I did, that's what I tried to write about, to say that we wanted to give credit to Limud because I passionately believe that it's a positive thing. I wanted to just pay homage to that and give credit where it's due, but also to say we're going to do it a little bit on our terms and that I don't think it's wise for us just to copy a model and then apply it in a different community. In our third example, the influence of Limud is not so direct or obvious, but it did exist in the founders and organizers' sense of what was possible and in their con con confidence in their ability to set up something new and ambitious. And sometimes, too, they adopted practical rules for cross-communal coexistence that had been worked out partly by trial and error at Limud. Helena Miller, who has been a central figure in Limud since 1981, went on to help found the JCOS, the Jewish Community Secondary School, uh, which opened in 2010, the very first cross-communal Jewish school in Britain. Thinking about whether uh, Limwood had influenced this, she was uh, sort of halfway on the scale. She said, my experience of Limwood was more about that I knew we could do big things. You know, we'd helped develop Limwood, and that was a big, new big thing. Limwood made us much more confident Jewishly and much more able to see our Jewish lives across the denominations, that we didn't feel pigeonholed. And that was important for JCOS, that there was no pigeonholing. I think the fact that we knew it was possible to have a cross-denominational, a cross-communal entity that worked, I suppose from that point of view, yes, Limud worked. So we had conversations about, for example, how we would do a Shabbaton, a residential weekend, when we knew that there were some Shoma Shabbat, some Sabbath observant people, and people who didn't want to do anything Sabbath related. And so we kind of used the Limud rubrics to settle on what to do. So public space with Shoma Shabbat, but if somebody wanted to turn the light on in their room, that would be fine. So that, I suppose, did take from Limud. But I think implicitly, rather than explicitly, most of the time. 
And moving on last to Limud's ability to adapt brings us up to date with some remarkable adjustments to the pandemic, as well as possibly some missed opportunities. Again, we've seen adaptation before, new sites, new communities and so on. But the pandemic really showed up Limud's ability to pivot very fast and adapt to the unexpected. In just six weeks, a small team of volunteers managed to put on an online event, Limud Together, on the 3rd of May 2020, which was attended by about 3,000 participants from 37 countries, including 500 people who had never been to a Limud event before. The Limud activist who helped organize this and initiated it reported rather giddily the day after the event, invites went out to present us in three days. The tech parameters were sorted in a week. A three-line budget glided past the watchful eye of Limud's treasurer. There were, I think, 16 calls, 11 high traffic WhatsApp groups that I know. Presenters just kept smiling and agreeing to speak. There was a pub quiz, there were sing-alongs, there was somehow a panel with young British Jews working for the Foreign Office, which got more than 500 people on the day. But the event's success was, of course, underwritten by the previous experience of the volunteers. We all knew more or less how to use Zoom already. The team were all people who had had extensive experience. There was no need for training handovers. Everything we were doing was unprecedented, but also stuff that we had done before. All long, long time Limud volunteers who knew exactly what they were doing. So it was very, very easy. Limud also organized a successful online festival in December 2020, the day the 5,000 participants, and a somewhat less successful one in December 2021, back to about, about 3,000. That one was much more criticized. Partly people were over-zoomed, but there was also a, a, an expectation that Limud would develop the format, would do something more exciting. And the crucial miss missing element that everybody agreed was the lack of the social matrix, which brings us back to our beginning to the community aspect of Limud. The chance encounter, the dinner queue, the serendipitous discovery of a totally known subject in a session, and the ability to share and discuss experiences with friends and acquaintances. Everyone said, it's not the same. But will Limud ever be the same again? This year we'll see the first in-person festival since 2019, but it faces even more new challenges. The long established volunteer pipeline has been broken by the two year hiatus. This year's festival is being organized by a drastically reduced team. Nobody knows how many participants will actually turn up, making financial planning very precarious. People have got out of the habit of going to the mood and the cost of attendance continues to climb, very much discouraging young people who are the bulk of the volunteer pool. And uncertainties about COVID may discourage elderly participants from coming. The pandemic does offer a chance for a reset of the Limud formula, an opportunity for reimagining how Limud might adapt and remain relevant in a post-pandemic world. Will that chance be seized? I should be there in December to research this latest chapter in Limud's epic journey. And I'd just like to end with one volunteer's assessment or analysis of what he sees as Limud's future prospects. Hopefully this year we can start producing something that will get people excited. And the bet is that if you get people excited, people will follow. If you promise an event that will be exciting, that will challenge conventions, that will feature everything that people are really looking for, then it will come back. As long as we can keep people excited, and as long as people still identify with what Limud stands for, then we have a place. And when people lose that affinity with Limud, what Limud stands for, Limud's vision, in its mission, that's when we'll have a serious problem. <laughs>